Hello and welcome to Five Year Club video number 98. A little uh, tax update and then let's discuss some things in the news. Tax time's coming up. I think the deadline is, what, April 15th, April 16th? My tax is already done so I don't have to worry about it, but you might and if you have to worry about it, let's go look at if you need to uh, do anything with retirement um, before you file your taxes or perhaps you have already filed your taxes and you forgot to do something for retirement so now it's time to amend your tax return. All right, well, to responsibly contribute to retirement, first we need to make sure that your uh, other other parts of your financial house are in order. So let's review the uh, first four steps. Number one is save $1,000 of cash. That is to make sure you never need to do anything like take out a payday loan. Number two is pay off all your non-mortgage debt, all your credit card debt, all of your student loans. Uh, you're going to spend all of your financial um, firepower paying off all non-mortgage debt in step number two. In step number three, we're going to revisit the, uh, the savings. So on top of that $1,000, in step number three, you're going to save six, three to six months of expenses in an emergency fund. Obviously, the lower you can get your expenses, the faster you're going to be able to build up that emergency fund. And finally, once you have an emergency fund, then we begin to contribute to retirement. Dave Ramsey recommends 15% of gross income saved uh, for retirement, but the more you put in, the earlier you retire because investments grow exponentially. The money you put in earlier uh, is going to be worth exponentially more than money that goes in later, so you can um, more efficiently pay for your retirement the earlier that you do it. So if you are at step four and you can contribute to uh, retirement, I've got several tax shelters to mention for the 2017 year. Um, let's see, actually, you know what? Can I contribute to 2017 HSA in 2018? Do, 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 and deadlines. What's the deadline here? Uh, April 15th. Good. So the HSA indeed has the same deadline as this other stuff. So I was not mistaken when I mentioned uh, you didn't see the window that I opened. That's sad. And yeah, let's put it here. Yeah. So this is the, uh, the thing I just looked up. And uh, yeah, HSAs you can contribute to the prior year um, if you want. All right, so IRAs have a contribution limit of 5,500. 401ks have a contribution limit of, I believe, 18,000 for 2017. And the HSA has a contribution limit of 3,450, 3,450. All of them grow tax-free. IRAs are pre-tax money. So if you are in a high state tax like California and plan on retiring outside of California, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I just messed that up. Uh, the uh, traditional accounts, so there are traditional IRAs and traditional 401ks. That is pre-tax money. If you are in a high-tax state like California, you may want to do a traditional because then you will avoid California's state income tax later if you retire outside of California. Um, for people who are in lower tax brackets but plan on being in higher tax brackets later, maybe you're at the beginning of your career and you know you're going to make more money in the future, you know you're going to have kids or something in the future, and you're going to have to pay more money, and so you're going to have to realize more income in the future to pay for those kids, then you might want to go with a Roth now. So there are both Roth IRAs and Roth 401ks. Roth 401k is newer, so not all employers offer it, but if you have it as an option and that's your tax situation, you should consider that. Health savings account. This is an excellent way to pay for health care. And if you are a high income earner, it's an excellent way to save up a little retirement hoard on top of the IRA and the 401k. The way you would do that uh, is that you would pay your uh, medical expenses out of pocket. You would set aside some savings to do that. And then you would contribute the max to the health savings account every year, invest it in the S&P 500, let it grow uh, tax-free for uh, a long time, actually. And then at age 65, you're allowed to withdraw it. Another thing you can do with the HSA is if you have a medical bill, you can just keep the receipt. And if you ever need the money, 
you can redeem that receipt from the HSA. And there is no time limit for redeeming the receipt. So you can just keep a file folder of medical receipts and they're almost like cash because you can um, select one, write a check to yourself from your HSA. And if the IRS comes asking, um, is this a legitimate charge? You have the receipt to say, yes, it's a legitimate charge. And once again, if you have already filed and you want to do one of these things, you can amend your return. It's really easy with TurboTax. I'm sure there are probably other tax services that make it relatively easy. Um, under about 70K of income per year, I think, the traditional IRA will give you a tax deduction. Um, and the 401K, uh, it comes out of your paycheck. Um, and with those, the quote unquote deduction happens as you contribute to it. So the IRA is the one that you're going to be looking to get the, to get the deduction from. I think the HS, HSA might also have a deduction. Yeah, it must. The HSA also has a deduction. So you should look into that. All right. Um, someone asked me about this and I just wanted to repeat it for anybody else. Contributing money to these accounts is the most important thing. If the traditional versus Roth is confusing for you, if the 401k versus IRA is confusing for you, the fact that the 401k can have a match, and if it does, you should probably contribute to that first, versus these, you know, versus not having a match, all these different details, it can get overwhelming. They don't actually matter that much. What does actually matter that much is that you make it happen. You put money into the accounts. If you want to if you want to just kind of split your risk on the taxes, you can do half the money into a Roth, half the money into a traditional. Um, you can work out the details later in terms of shuffling it around to, to the greatest tax advantage. Um, but the most important thing is that you get some money into the account. So if you have the money uh, and you have that emergency fund, so it's not going to put you in trouble to contribute to these accounts, contribute to them, let your future self worry about earning more money and coming up with more savings to do stuff. Um, it's really important and really efficient that these, uh, that wasn't a proper sentence, but I'm gonna continue, <laughs> that these accounts get uh, as much money into them as early as possible. It's better in a 30 year plan for you to contribute for the first 10 years than for you to contribute for the final 20 years. That's how bit, that's how important it is um, the early money. And now is the earliest time for the rest of your life. So put as much money as you can into the account as long as you have that emergency fund to keep you in the financially safe and sane territory. If you're wondering uh, about opening an IRA and you don't want to think about it uh, and you want the quick advice, my advice is to open an account with Vanguard and put all of your contribution into VTI. Uh, that's an exchange traded fund, an ETF, that is a uh, total stock market index. It holds the entire stock market and you will just wanna buy VTI and never sell it. And that's, that's the plan and, it's, and, it, and it works really, really well. Uh, another option is you could open an account with Betterment and use whatever Betterment's default um, allocations and investments are. It's going to be mostly VTI and um, and Betterment has low fees. The reason why I suggest Vanguard first is because Betterment has uh, a little higher fees than Vanguard, but they're not so high that I wouldn't recommend it, it that I wouldn't recommend them, and they also have other features that are kind of cool. So whatever you want to do, again, first recommendation, open an account with Vanguard, put everything into VTI, hold it forever. If not that, open an account with Betterment. It's super easy. Uh, you can transfer money online from bank account information that you put in, it's really not that hard, and just use whatever the default allocation is. Um, it is not terrible, and as you learn more about investing, you can change it later. It's really not a big deal. I frequently, as a hobby, look up the word debt on Google News, and I found it really interesting recently uh, that, oh, I'm transitioning now, by the way. New topic, guys. 9.55 p.m., Lewis doesn't bother to transition. Yep. I frequently look up the word debt on Google News and then I just read whatever the latest news is about debt. And uh, I found two articles interesting uh, recently. The first talked about how millennials are missing out on life because they have more debt 
than savings. And uh, a dark new poll found that many 18 to 34 year olds are waiting to have kids, get married, buy a house, or save for retirement because of crushing debt. And I can totally understand this in my area. Houses are a million dollars. So if you think you need a house to have kids, it's going to take a while to get there. It's like literally five times more expensive than the state that I came from. And let's just read the quote that I liked from this article. All right, the full findings lay bare the generation's staggering debt burden. While 76% of millennials owe money in some form, 55% struggle with debts over $5,000. Meanwhile, only 23% of millennials say they have $5,000 or more in their savings account. The huge costs of college can explain some of this mess. Surprisingly, however, the survey showed credit card debt is even more widespread than student loan debt, with 46% of millennials currently paying off credit cards and only 36% paying off college. The racial component is also distressing. Young African Americans are the most likely to have no personal savings and have more student loan debt than any other group. Similarly, more African Americans, 72%, say, said they would struggle to pay an unexpected bill more than any other group. I think the number for white Americans is uh, is 63%, and Asians are 65%, and Latinos are also around 72%. Um, just for context. Um, perhaps the weirdest, saddest part of today's survey is the presumption millennials are currently having to delay uh, commonly agreed life goals as if debt is just a temporary blip and we'll all get there in the end. At least most are staying optimistic. 58% responded that with a good job, they'll be able to pay off their debt and afford the lifestyle they want. Well, guys, the unemployment rate is about as low as it's ever going to get, and it is going to uh, go up in the next 10 years at some point. That's called a recession. We have them regularly. And when that happens... If you don't have savings, and this is saying that many people do not, you are going to get your ass kicked and you are not going to be able to strategically align yourself and to get that better job. You're not going to have um, the time in your job hunt to be patient and to pick a higher paying job. Instead, you're going to be pressured into picking something faster and that's not going to pay as much. My point is, this article is saying people are staying optimistic they'll get a better job. If you want that, Save some money. Save some money. Have that emergency fund so that you have uh, flexibility in your job hunt and you can land a higher paying job. That's one of the powers uh, of savings. All right, and then we have another article from CNN. And uh, millennials aren't opening credit cards. That's a mistake. What? I thought you just told me that most of like credit cards were the biggest problem. And now this article is saying that millennials aren't opening credit cards and that's a mistake. You know, so I look at this article and uh and these uh and these glamorous people talking, which I need to pause. Are you pa Wow, I'm glad I put that audio down because that was really painful. Nobody cares about your laptops. All right. Um, the author of this article is Nathaniel Merson, and the creep that I am, I looked him up on LinkedIn, because I'm always interested, who will write an article like millennials aren't opening credit cards, that's a mistake. He has a, uh, a bachelor's degree in American history from Emory University, a private university, expensive school. And in 2011, when the economy was in the crapper, he went into school and he chose a history major. Maybe he didn't choose a history major his freshman year, but when we had just had this big recession, he chooses a history major at a very expensive private school. It's not a very good financial decision. Uh, so this article is written by a guy who graduated three years ago uh, did not make a good return on investment decision when he selected his college. And let's analyze the uh, the college selection uh, math a little bit. I think this is uh, 
I think I've talked about it before, but it's good to repeat and it's good for people to understand. There are websites where you can look up the return on investment for colleges. Turns out I will paste them in the description and you can do the research yourself. Emory University, for example, you will pay $242,000 and you will get $315,000 back from that investment. So in other words, um, compared to a high school, uh, compared to somebody who just went to high school, uh, you will make 242 plus 315 more than them. And this 315 number comes from the total earnings beyond the high school person, minus what you paid for it, minus that 242. We can compare this to a school in Georgia, not that far from Emory, called Georgia Tech. In Georgia Tech, you would pay less than half the cost of Emory, so instead of paying 242, you would pay 96,000. And uh, I used, um, let's see, in-state numbers for these, because I just assumed the person was Georgia, because I'm from Georgia. Or I just assumed because, like, I'm trying to point out the difference in, like, uh, places that you would go in your state. Because that's where most people go. So Georgia Tech. You go to Georgia Tech and specifically you major in engineering. 96,000 in, 897,000 out. Wow, that is a big difference. 242 to 315 or 96 to 897. That is a huge difference in return on investment. All right. 100% 100% like disclosure here, I went to a private school, went to Cornell, so I kind of did a mix of these two. I, you know, the cost when I went was like 160, it's now 250, so it's now even more expensive than Emory. But since I did engineering, uh, it has a nice return on investment, like 925, right? That's not too bad, could be worse, 925. What I want to point out now, though, is I want to point out how you would actually think about this as an investor, right? And the way that I think about it, you kind of take the output and then you divide it by the input and that's like kind of how much you multiplied your money. So if you do that and you say, uh, you know, this, um, you know, final earnings number divided by the input numbers, you're going to get a graph that looks like this. And uh, you see Emory here that the author went to. If you major in the humanities, that, that's at the bottom. Georgia Tech is incredibly efficient because for in-state people, it's not very expensive. And those are solid jobs, even in a recession, those engineering jobs. And you make good money. Uh, Cornell, as you can see, it said 925, right? Which is uh, higher than 897. So I guess uh, you could make the argument that um, because this is 925 after subtracting out the 250, you could make the argument that like Cornell is more profitable to go to. However, um, you know, it's like if you had the 250,000 to begin with and you are the Georgia Tech person, you could, uh, for example, invest, um, let's see, $150,000 in the S&P 500 and let that ride over the next 20 years and then include the 897. And if you did that, Georgia Tech would, would beat Cornell handily. And so if you're really comparing like apples to apples, Georgia Tech wins on return on investment hands down because it is simply, it's simply too difficult uh, to out-earn this incredible initial difference in price, $250,000 versus $96,000. Um, the, the calculation for me, you know, if, if $160,000 uh, is what my college cost between 2003 and 2007, if you use an S&P 500 calculator reinvesting all the dividends, that would be $612,000 today. I don't remember what Georgia co- Tech cost exactly back in 2003 to 2007, and I didn't bother to look it up. But even if we do a very conservative estimate and we say that it cost half of what Cornell cost, which it did not, it cost less than that, um, to make up the $300,000 difference here, um, I would need to earn take-home pay of $30,000 more per year for the last 10 years, which means that my gross salary pay, because of the tax rates, would need to be like $55,000 more, something like that. And I got to tell you, for these engineering jobs, they just do not pay Ivy League grads $55,000 more than 
high-quality state school grads. They don't. They don't pay a, a Stanford grad that much more than a Berkeley grad. Uh, it really depends on the job title and how well you did in the engineering interview. And I can tell you, having spent time at Stanford, having spent time at Berkeley, having spent time at Cornell, and knowing a lot of people who went to Georgia Tech, it's all the same stuff in undergrad. It's all the same curriculum. And so return on investment for schools, hands down, high quality state schools, because of the incredible difference in cost, are going to beat the private schools. Prestige colleges do not build wealth. They just cost money. All right, let's go back to this article. Why is it a mistake to not open a credit card? These are the points in the article. Because people need to build a credit score. And the article mentions taking out a car loan for a new car, a rapidly depreciating new car. And that's the reason why you need to have a credit score. That is the number one thing the article says. Really? And this is a personal finance? It's cnn.com slash pf. You know? PF, personal finance. And they're saying that you need to build a credit score so that you can take out a car loan for a new car? What? Now, first home, for sure, uh, a credit score will smooth the process. But I believe you can get a manually underwritten loan, and it's not going to be that different. You have to show two years of uh, pay stubs, two years of taxes, uh, but you're going to be working for two years just to save up a down payment anyway. Really not that big of a deal. Good luck if you don't have a credit score. Hey, Mr. Snark. Uh, number two, rewards, rewards, rewards. Credit cards provide great opportunities, great opportunities to score rewards for your day-to-day -day spending. All right, let's clue you in. Credit card rewards at their best are like 2%, whereas the S&P 500 has been returning like, you know, 7%, 9%, depending on the time period you look at and depending upon whether you are looking at the real return or you are looking at the return including inflation. What this means is that money that you save and you invest in the S&P 500 in the long run is going to absolutely crush any benefit you get from a credit card. And this means that saving money is the number one way and investing it is the number one way to build your wealth passively. But credit card rewards are proportional to spending and spending is the opposite of saving. It does not help you build net worth. And, uh, and so kind of rewards, rewards, rewards is stupid, stupid, stupid. Um, it's, not a, it's not a good financial plan. We need to pay attention to our savings and our investment. And finally, number three, fraud protection. Another compelling reason to opt for credit cards over debit cards is because they're a better safeguard against potential fraud. I got to say, what is the bigger problem in America? Consumer debt or fraud? Hands down, it's consumer debt. I'm not saying there's not a lot of fraud. Certainly my credit cards have been, uh, I, sh I don't have any credit cards. My debit cards have been compromised more times than I remember in the last 10 years. Probably three or five, uh, something pretty high. And I just learned the other day that a website that held my credit card information um, did not have a good security and leaked my credit card information. Uh, so no doubt fraud exists, but when it comes to people's personal finance, it is debt that is taking people down not fraud. Uh, furthermore, if you look at protection against fraud, if you have a debit card, it can be run two different ways when you make a purchase. It can be run as a credit card or it can be run as a debit card. You get more protections running it as a credit card through the credit system than running it as a debit card. That doesn't mean you're taking out debt. It is simply a detail of how the transaction is processed. So if you're making a big purchase and you have a choice of whether to put in your PIN number and run it as a debit transaction or the choice of putting your signature on it and running it as a credit transaction, you probably run it as a credit transaction. It's going to deduct money from your bank account either way. There, there's difference in processing fees for the business, but there is zero difference in the cost to you. So that is a deal with debit cards. As you can see, I think this is a very poor article. Um, you know, it occurred to me, like, I hope this guy doesn't have student loan debt. If he does have student loan debt, I hope he's making good money so he can pay off his student loan debt. And the only way that I can imagine an article like this 
making good money is if it was sponsored by someone interested in promoting these ideas and who would be interested in promoting building a credit score and using credit card rewards and fraud protection credit card companies that's right so it would not surprise me at all if a credit card company uh, was a sponsor behind this article in fact we i wonder if we could actually even see that somewhere here cnn money all right i gotta look up a relationship between uh, cnn money and banks our terms and service and privacy policy have changed okay i don't care and powered by smartasset.com wow I, I paused that and then it started an ad and that was really loud okay powered by smartasset.com ally Okay, is this an ad or is this part of the article? Disclosures. I don't know, it's hard to tell. And maybe if we get to the end, it will say like this is actually sponsored. CNN Money, New York, paid content. I think that's referring to stuff below. Yeah, I don't know, but uh, I think it is a very, I think it's a shallow article and I think it's bad advice. So there you go. I hope that uh, helps you to think more critically about CNN money articles that you see. And that is it for five-year club video number 98. Thank you for joining me and have a fabulous evening.